Okay, chapter six is all about rates of reaction, otherwise known as kinetics. Um, first five learning goals relate to this first lesson. So from here, you'll be able to calculate average and instantaneous rates of reaction, uh, whether the data is in tables or graphs. Sketch graphs of the concentration of reactants versus time and also concentration of products versus time. Use the mole ratio stoichiometric relationships to calculate rates of consumption of reactants and production of products. Propose methods of measuring the rate of a reaction and then use proper notation to manipulate the units to express rate. Rust doesn't form overnight. So if we have an object that becomes uh, rusty over time, it takes possibly months for that reaction to occur. So just writing a balanced equation showing us that a reaction does occur doesn't actually tell us anything about how fast or slow that reaction occurs. So we really don't know anything about the rate just by the fact that the reaction occurs. So rate studies are done and we'll explore those as we move through the unit. To define rate then, rate of a reaction is really the speed at which that reaction occurs. Typically it's expressed in um, as a change in concentration of either reactants or products over time. So here you can see I'm using lowercase r to represent rate, delta c as change in concentration over change in time. So if we think of a concentration as being measured in moles per liter, then our unit of the numerator here is moles per liter, and perhaps seconds depends on, on the uh, reaction time, but could have been minutes but let's say moles per liter per second. Now, if we're looking to uh, simplify this unit, perhaps we wanna write it horizontally with the division. So moles per liter divided by seconds. And now we can see that moles per liter multiplied by the reciprocal one over seconds leads us to moles per liter second. So that's one option of a simplified rate unit here for the rate. Another way to do it would have been to incorporate negative exponents. So for ha perhaps moles, liters to the negative one, seconds to the negative one. So that's another option that would work too. Perhaps you use capital M to represent moles per liter. And so we have moles per liter per second, or again, bring in the negative exponent. So again, these are also options. So you need to get comfortable working with units of moles per liter per second or per unit time, whatever that time unit's going to be. Okay, moving on. Okay, to look at graphing here, I'm asking you to sketch a graph of the change in the concentration of products over time. So think perhaps of a metal being dropped in acid. The hydrogen gas bubbles are produced. Think of what that looks like in a test tube or a beaker. And I'm asking you to then sketch the graph of how the products change in concentration over the course of the reaction. So you have a choice of whether you're going to do a linear or a nonlinear relationship whether you're going to have positive slope, negative slope, zero slope, whatever, whatever that may look like. So think about time t equals zero. Does the origin have meaning here? Do we have any products at time t equals zero? So what's the concentration at time t equals zero? And then how does that change over time? So draw the both then for products and reactants and Check the video after you've tried it yourself. Okay, so these were tricky to come up with. You will see that at time t equals zero, the concentration of products is zero. So hopefully that makes sense that we haven't had reactants convert to products yet. And then initially they start to form. And if you consider the slope of the curve, so the slope of a tangent at this point, Right? It has a certain steepness here. And as time continues, you'll see the slope of the tangent actually decreases. 
So we start off with a very steep line and then it gets more and more shallow, less and less steep until it hits zero. This slope is actually the rate of the reaction. So initially the rate is quite fast and you can see that as reactant particles are consumed over time, more and more product is formed, the rate slows down. Now, it appears that the rate reaches zero here, or the reaction stops, but I'll just, we're going to speak a lot more about that in the next unit, but I'll just emphasize here that the concentration of the product has stopped changing over time. Now, what's happening on the reactant side? We start with a certain concentration, there it is, not zero, and now we see a negative slope, right? This was a positive slope on this side. Now we see a steep negative slope of the tangent. And that curve, or the slope of the tangent, changes, right, and gets more and more shallow until it's horizontal. So a negative slope because reactants are consumed. So the steepness gives us the magnitude and the sign, right, the fact that it's positive or negative relates to the idea that products are produced and reactants are consumed. Okay, for the graphing exercise that you'll be doing in class, um, be sure to use a pencil and a ruler and you want your graph as large as possible. I will have graph paper for you. Um, you want to be at least half a page. There should be a title, and typically for your title, a, a graph of y versus x works well, where y and x would be substituted with the names of those um, quantities on those axes. Label your axes with units in round brackets. Um, scale the axes properly. X and y don't have to have the same scale, but it does need to be consistent once you're do you know moving every line is every five units on the y-axis it needs to keep following that plot with pencil dot points so not large circles like uh, scantron card circles but dots and then draw a line of best fit for linear data and a smooth curve for nonlinear data okay so you'll be drawing a graph in class and analyzing that graph when you go to analyze the graph you'll be asked for average and instantaneous rate. So an average rate is referring to the rate over a period of time. So let's say from T1 to T2. So if I follow that up to the, the curve here and draw a straight line, let's see if I can do this. So there is a straight line connecting the point where the curve uh, touches at T1 and T2. And so then the slope here is going to be the rate. So to calculate the rate, we'll be doing delta C over delta T. Again, focusing, oh, this shifted a little bit. There we go. Again, the ordered pair here would be T1, C1, and over here it would be T2, C2, and so we can plug those in delta C over delta T, right? Thinking C2 minus C1 over T2 minus T1. Instantaneous rate, on the other hand, would be just looking for the rate at a particular point in time, so let's say T1. So now when you draw your line, it needs to be a tangent. So it needs to be a straight line that touches the curve at only one point. So average rate comes from the slope of the secant, which is the line that touches the curve at two points, T1 and T2. Instantaneous rate comes from finding the slope of the tangent at T1. So you do not have to use that point at T1. It's any two points on the line. You could further extend this line and actually use the intercept. That would be probably an easier point to estimate. And so we'd be at zero and whatever that point was. So there would be C1, perhaps over here, or you want to extend, 
or pick the point right on the curve, it doesn't matter. You just need a second, a second point. In this case, we'll say uh, T2 and C2. And so we'll be calculating the slope again. So again, rate will come from delta C over delta T, right? C2 minus C1 over T2 minus T1. You can do that from a graph or you can do that from a table. So pay attention to what's been asked there. Um, that formula can be applied to the table or the graph, but if you have a graph, just draw your secant, find the slope for average rate, and for instantaneous rate, find the slope of the tangent. Okay, so taking a look at this reaction now, magnesium, piece of magnesium placed in acid to produce hydrogen gas and magnesium chloride, so aqueous magnesium chloride ions. How might we measure this rate? I know we've been emphasizing change in concentration over time, but there are other ways that we could collect data to indicate how fast or slow this reaction is occurring. So perhaps we consider the conductivity. If we're producing aqueous ions, and there could be a color intensity here that a spectrophotometer could help pick up, but magnesium and chloride ions are actually uh, colorless. So perhaps change in conductivity over time. All right, what about the fact that this is an acid? Could we use uh, a pH probe and measure the change in pH over time? Or the fact that a gas is produced? We could collect the gas and measure the change in volume or perhaps pressure of that hydrogen gas over time. And we could even measure change in mass of that gas, right? If the gas is allowed to escape, we'll be able to measure and see how the, the mass is changing over time. So there's you know a number of different ways that we can measure a rate depends on the reaction that's happening and you need to design an experiment based on the reaction that's happening. Okay, uh, almost finished. The One of the learning goals we haven't addressed yet was the idea of stoichiometric relationships. Okay, so let's take this equation. A plus 2B produces C. And you notice that I've indicated here that the rate of, and I'll make a point here that there's a negative, so the rate of consumption of A is 0 0.5 moles per liter second. So the question could be then to find the rate of consumption of B and the rate of production of C. So we do this um, by following the mole ratio or the stoichiometry of the balanced equation. I would suggest that you call the rate that you're trying to find, that you call that x, so we'll call the rate here of b x, and that you set up a, a proportion where that will include x and you'll be able to then solve for x. So the idea here is that this 0 0.5 moles per liter per second to x will equal the ratio of 1 to 2. And so we're going to follow that ratio. So 0 0.5 over x equals 1 over 2. Now you can multiply by x on both sides or cross multiply, whichever you like, and we'll end up with 1.0. And so the rate then of consumption, you'll notice I put the negative of b, is negative 1.0 mole per liter per second. Now what about C? We could call that Y and set it up. So 0 0.5 to Y will equal, as you can see, the coefficient is 1 to 1. And so I'll work it out just so we can see the math of that, but cross multiply here and Y will be equal to 0 0.5. So the rate I'll interpret then as positive 0 0.5 moles per liter second. Now just to be clear, I'm choosing to put the negative or the positive in the final statement of rate based on whether 
it's a reactant being consumed or a product that's being produced. Now you will see some notation that is relevant here, so I'll just go through what that notation looks like. Instead of just having the R there, I could have also said change in the concentration of A over time and put a negative out front. And so this expression here means the rate of consumption of A. It's notation you should be familiar with, but I'm okay if you solve the problem assigning x to be the unknown rate. And so we would then state the rate in a positive magnitude because we've already accounted for the negative in our terminology there. And actually, I just realized that that was actually b, wasn't it? So, okay. Um, whereas on the other side here, we have the change in the concentration of C over time, right? And I'll leave that as a positive or otherwise we don't even need to put the positive there. But the idea is that this is the rate of production of C. And we again can list that as a positive value. So you should be familiar. That should, you know, be, you should be able to interpret notation like that if you see it somewhere. So you'll find there are questions where you need to solve for a rate of a certain reactant or product given the rate of another reactant or product and essentially just use the mole ratio, set up a proportion, and solve for the unknown. Okay, and the last part here, factors that affect rate. We will be studying the why behind each of these. For now, it is enough to just know the factors that affect rate. So you should know how they affect rate. We'll be studying why they affect rate uh, in a subsequent lesson. So first, the nature of the reactant. So knowing that as you go down a group of metals, the metals get more reactive. For example, potassium is more reactive than sodium is in part of the nature of those alkali metals. Temperature. Rate definitely varies directly with temperature. You increase the temperature, you increase the rate. Think of cooking, right? You need to turn up the temperature and to cook that food faster. And also think of slowing the rate of food spoiling. We put food in the fridge or even the freezer to keep it um, lasting longer. Catalyst. We have enzymes. We also have chemical catalysts that we can use in reactions. Manganese dioxide is one of those. If you put manganese dioxide, a black solid powder, into hydrogen peroxide, it will speed up the rate of the decomposition of the H2O2. Concentration certainly affects rate. Um, an example would be hydrogen gas produced when a metal reacts with hydrochloric acid. If you have that metal react with one mole per liter hydrochloric acid compared to 0.1 molar acid, you'll definitely see bubbles being produced at a faster rate with the higher concentration. And the last one being surface area. So maybe think of an um, antacid tablet and imagine a solid piece compared to a crushed piece. The crushed piece has a larger surface area and that definitely increases rate. Okay, so to be clear here, when we increase uh, concentration, we increase rate. When we increase surface area, we increase rate. When we increase temperature, we increase rate. And a catalyst serves to increase rate. Okay, we'll explore the why behind those um, when we study collision theory.